we have um, one of my favorite speakers, Susan Bolio, who's talking about A scores today. She's done this before. I think you know, the, she's right up there with Mike Osterholm, the, some of the speakers that we have coming. Mike Osterholm is always fun. Susan is always super fun. So she's going to be talking today about A scores. She's a, a tribal community facilitator at the University of Minnesota Extension. And she's given many talks on our Echo about different things. This is one of my favorites on her ACE scores and trauma. Next slide. Um, so just some announcements real quickly. Next slide. Um, remember, these are recorded. Uh, it, we would prefer that you turn on your cameras so that uh, Susan can see you when, uh, uh, when she's talking. That makes it much more fun for us. Next slide. Um, and again, there's free CME, so please make sure that you uh, fill out the little thing at the end, and that will get you your CME. It's all free. I get tons of these uh, every year. It's great. Um, yep, go one more, Susan. Um, and again, if there's more than one person in your room, please let us know and rename yourself. Uh, as far as uh, getting the CME, it's important to know who's in there. Next slide. Um, uh, case presentations. Again, this is uh, based on the ECHO model. If there's any cases that you would like to bring up, uh, please uh, let us know. We would be happy to put those at the end of any of these. So uh, keep that in mind. Uh, some of the later talks we give, we'll have, uh, we'll have cases of our own if there's not cases. So we will let Susan go ahead. And if you want to talk uh, any more about what you actually do in real life, Susan, please uh, feel free. So yeah. welcome back. Thanks so much, Kurt. Um, hello, Buju, Nagana Benesi Kwe, and Indigenous Kaz, Megazin and Dodem, Meskwag, Mevazaga, Iganin, and Donjaba. So, hello, my name is Susan Bolio. I'm a citizen of the Red Lake Nation, and I reside in Brainerd, Minnesota with my family, but I work for the University of Minnesota Extension, like, um, uh, like Dr. Kurt said. So um, I am a tribal community facilitator, and a lot of the work that I've been doing for the last seven years or so has been around bringing this information around adverse childhood adverse childhood experiences, historical trauma and resilience to tribal communities. Um, I realized just now, as I said that, I was like, I, we're not going to be talking about historical trauma today. We don't have time to dive into all of that. Um, but that's a lot of the work that I do is helping to sort of thread through and connect those dots for our community members. Um, Oh, these are some more. I, I thought there, these are a couple other slides um, that are not mine that are in there. I don't know if anybody wants to. Yeah, let me just uh, yeah. quickly. Our Tuesday one's coming up. Uh, Mental health and addiction is January 4th. Uh, I'm actually giving the talk on overlap and addiction and chronic pain on the 18th and then addiction screening. So, yeah, I didn't know those were in there. They must got out of order. Can go to the next slide, see if there's anything else. And remember, tomorrow we're going to have our continued talk on microinductions and macroinductions. Uh, from the University of Minnesota uh, Addiction uh, Fellows, and they're giving a talk. It was a great talk last week, and they're going to finish it up this week. So, okay. And remember, if you, any of these talks, if a lot of talks, 75 different topics on the addiction connection, please feel free to uh, find those at your leisure. Uh, we just put out one, a brand new one today on opioids during, uh, during COVID, which has been terrible. Uh, we've had over 100,000 opioid death or overdose deaths in the U.S. Uh, it's been uh, a pretty bad uh, year for everybody. So, okay. All right. Thank you. Um, so um, these are the objectives for today, and I, I won't go through them. Um, there, I think you have a PDF of these slides as well. But the session overview will be just sort of doing an overview of ACEs 101, talking about epigenetics, the autonomic nervous system, so the, the two parts of the system and how with trauma and toxic stress um, that, that system can sort of get stuck. Um, trauma and neurodevelopment, and then talking some about resilience and some strategies for resetting the autonomic nervous system. So I actually, um, before we jump into this, I'd like to just take a minute or two and do a little bit of grounding, bringing us into the space together. And this breath practice is one that is like our breath is one of the most powerful tools we have to regulate our nerv nervous system. So as we're talking about or thinking about trauma and building resilience and 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 ways for healing, using breath practices to uh, get into our body, to regulate the nervous system is really important. And this is a practice that I learned as a mind-body medicine facilitator. It's a foundational practice. And what it does is we're bringing the breath 
from the chest, which when we're under in that fight or flight response, our breath tends to be short, shallow in the chest. We're going to bring that down into the belly, expanding the diaphragm. And when we do that, we activate the vagal nerve, which sends the message back to the brain that we're physically safe. Because if we were running or fighting for our lives, taking that slow, deep belly breath would be impossible. So I invite you just to get yourself into a comfortable position, preferably in a position where you're, you know, you're your torso is sitting upright so that you can really expand that diaphragm. You can do this eyes opened or closed, whatever feels most comfortable for you. And we'll just start by bringing our focus and attention to the breath. And let's start with the grounding breath, breathing deeply in through the nose, exhaling slowly out of the mouth. And as you continue breathing at whatever pace is comfortable, for you. I invite you to bring that breath deep into the diaphragm, imagining that the belly is like a balloon that you are slowly inflating as you inhale in through the nose, and then slowly deflating it as you exhale out through the mouth. If it's helpful for you, you can think to yourself soft as you breathe in through the nose and belly as you breathe out through the mouth to remind yourself to keep your belly nice and relaxed, to let that air come deep into the diaphragm. your mind starts wandering, just know that that is totally normal. The mind is used to wandering and thinking about what it wants, when it wants. So if you notice that your mind has wandered away from your breath, just gently bring your focus and attention back. Thinking soft as you breathe in through the nose and belly as you breathe out through the mouth. And if you'd like, you can close this meditation with another grounding breath, which is just a nice big inhale in through the nose. Exhaling slowly out of the mouth. And then as you bring yourself back into the space, maybe just taking a moment to pause and check in. How is your body feeling in this moment? Where are your emotions at? How is your mind, the quality of your thoughts, and then also checking in with that sense of connection to yourself and others. So we're just checking in with those different parts of ourselves. All right, miigwech, thank you for um, letting us start in that way. Um, so Originally, when I was first trained in the ACEs, you can see the, the pyramid on the left-hand side is the original um, ACEs pyramid, the original hypothesis of the study, which was that adverse childhood experiences would impact social, emotional, and cognitive impairment, which could lead to the adoption of health risk behaviors, which then would lead to disease, disability, and social problems, and then early death. So it was really was this um, notion of like from conception to death, how ACEs can impact um, the individual. But we know now, and um, there's been more studies coming out, and also as this information started getting out to other communities like mine in Indigenous communities, it was like, wait, our communities didn't just start with ACEs. Like ACEs didn't just show up one day. Um, it was something that happened because of the experiences that our ancestors had. So on the bottom, they sort of revi revise the pyramid and you can see generational embodiment and historical trauma at the bottom, which then leads to social conditions and a local context, which creates complex trauma and adverse childhood experiences, which then leads to high allostatic loads, disrupted neural development, which then leads to coping mechanisms. And unless people have opportunities to learn healthy coping mechanisms, we tend to turn to what's available. And that can be unhealthy coping mechanisms, lots of different 
things in there in addition to substance use issues, um, you know, being a workaholic and or being on our phones, all those types of things can be unhealthy coping mechanisms. And then there's this burden of disease, um, distress, criminalization, and even stigmatization, and then early death. And along the side, you can see there are things that are happening like microaggressions, implicit bias, and epigenetics also play a role in this whole process of the dysregulation of the nervous system and the need for coping mechanisms. So in the original ACEs study, there were 10 ACEs that they looked at, and these were based on the literature at the time, what um, sort of uh, traumas they were seeing that were really impacting people. But I want to preface this with saying these are not the only traumas that can happen to a young person. And there's some, um, some individuals that I've really been following a lot around this trauma work, Dr. Gabor Matei, and then to Thomas Hubel. And there really is this notion that trauma is not necessarily the things that happen to us. Trauma isn't the same as a traumatic event, but, but it's what happens inside of us when we don't have the, the individual resources or the collective resources to help us navigate that traumatic situation. That's how trauma ends up getting stuck. And we'll talk more about that later. But so these original 10 ACEs, there were three categories. Under abuse, you have physical abuse, emotional abuse, and sexual abuse. Under neglect, there's physical and emotional neglect. And then under household dysfunction, there's mental illness, illness of a primary caregiver, incarcerated relatives, substance use issues, domestic violence, and separation or divorce. And the separation or, or divorce really speaks to the chaos, the fighting, all of that that happens in the household when parents aren't getting along and how that in and in of itself creates a toxic environment for the children. And what they also found in that original study is that there's this dose response relationship that the more ACEs somebody has, the more likely they are to experience negative health outcomes, negative social health, out social outcomes, negative mental health outcomes. Um, but it's not a one to one. This is an epidemiological study. So it's not, you know, sometimes when people um, take the thing and get their ACE score, they think, oh, my gosh, I have an eight or I have a 10. I'm, I'm doomed. Um, it's not that at all, because ACEs are just part of the picture. There's something called positive childhood experiences and a whole bunch of other things that can help mitigate and offset ACEs. Um, but what they found is, in general, the more ACEs someone had, the, the greater risk they had for all sorts of negative outcomes. I know this is hard to read. There's a lot of information on this slide, but this, again, is from the original ACEs study. And I think it's important to note that the original ACEs study was done with over 19,000 study participants in Southern California, primarily white, primarily middle class. And even in that population, highly educated, um, you know, all of them had, had, had good health insurance through Kaiser Permanente. So even in that population, which we might tend to think of as being like pretty good and healthy, there was a high prevalence of ACEs. And so you can see only 36% of those didn't have any ACEs. And then you can see around, you know, 26% had one, 16% had two, nine and a half percent had three ACEs, and um, 12, almost 12 and a half percent had four or more ACEs. And four or more is where you really start to see the impact, sort of the compounding effect of those ACEs over time. Um, and some ACE attributable problems, so problems that can be attributed to ACEs include everything from behaviors that we might have, lack of physical activity, use of substances, so smoking, alcohol, drug use, missed work, hard to get a job, hard to keep a job, and then lots of physical and mental health issues from severe obesity, diabetes, depression, suicide attempts, COPD, stroke, cancer, heart disease, et cetera. So this is a sort of a snapshot of some of the both behavioral and physical and mental health impacts of trauma unresolved. ACEs. And in addition, there's been a strong connection and correlation between unresolved trauma and things like addiction. So an 80% correlation between trauma and addiction, two thirds of those in recovery for addiction have experienced at least one ACE. Um, ACEs tend to be super high in the incarcerated um, populations as well. And then even in our juvenile justice system, a lot of the young people who are in that system, 75 to 93% in this study of, of almost 100,000 children shows that they had at least one ACE. So one of the things I think that's really important, and it's, all, it's exciting, um, but it, it's also really important to make sure we connect this dot, 
Because honestly, when I first started doing these presentations, sometimes I would hear from people, they would say like, well, you know, that happened a long time ago, you know, people should just get over it. But what, um, what the science is starting to show and what some indigenous wisdom has known is that the experiences of our ancestors gets passed down through the generations. And so um, epigenetics, epi means to sit on top of. So it's like what sits on top of our genetic code? I remember in um, when I was in high school and even early college, people were, there was a really robust debate, right, about is it nature, is it nurture, what's most important, um, what is most impactful. And the reality is, is that we all come into this world with a set of, with a, you know, specific DNA that's specific to us. Um, but our experiences actually can turn on and turn off genetic code. It can impact the way that that DNA is read. And I got to have a really interesting conversation with Dr. Brian Diaz, who all, um, who was one of the original lead researchers on the epigenetic study that I'll share in just a moment. And one of the things that he talked about is that with epigenetics, we have our chronological age and we have our biological age. So our chronological age, of course, is like every day we're a day older, every month we're we're a month older, every year we're a year older. And our biology is very much impacted by the things that happen to us on a day to day basis. So when we've experienced a lot of trauma, those two um, timelines, the biological and the chronological can be misaligned. So the chronological, we're still moving a day, a week, a month, a year at a time. But biologically, um, unresolved trauma speeds up the aging of the physical body. So the windows of, um, let's say the critical windows of development in childhood, if there's been a lot of unresolved trauma, those windows get compressed and shorter. So you might notice too, things like children um, going through puberty sooner, um, younger and younger. And that could be um, a result of that sort of unresolved trauma in the biological clock um, going faster. So the, the, one of the studies that helps us to understand what epigenetics is and, and the impact of it is one where they um, had male mice and in the bottom of the cages, they had shock pads. And every time they would infuse the scent of cherry blossom, they would shock the feet of the mice. So over time, we know an association was made between the pain and, and the smell. They took that first generation, they bred them to females, the females had pups, they didn't do anything to these baby mice. When they were fully grown, just the smell of cherry blossoms, and those little mice went into a fear response, shaking, terrified, trying to get out of their cages. They took the second generation, they bred them to females, the females had pups, didn't do anything to them, let them grow up. When they were fully grown, scented cherry blossoms, same terrified response. And there were more receptors in their nose to pick up the smell of cherry blossoms. And there had also been some changes and shifts in their actual, the, the structure of their brain. So all of these things help us to understand that um, epigenetics is a way that, that um, sort of the experiences of our ancestors can inform our lives in a way to try to improve chances of survival. So epigenetics, our nervous system, all of it is about survival. And so that being said, it's important to note that epigenetics is not just about the sort of traumas that happened that gets passed on, but also the strengths and resiliency of our ancestors that, ha that helped them stay alive, that allowed us to come into this world, right? Without our ancestors staying alive, we wouldn't be here today. So, um, so epigenetics really is about that transmission of information to improve the chances of survival for future generations. I really love this slide and it was shared with me actually not too long ago. This is from um, Stephen Porges and talking about looking at, looking at the nervous system and sort of when we're in our ventral vagal, there's a lot of social engagement, there's openness and curiosity, there's this, you know, um, uh, attempt to connect with people, joy in the present moment. And then as we start to get aroused, as you know, stress comes in or trauma comes in, we can go into fight or flight. So panic, fear, anxiety, worry, concern, rage, anger, irritation, frustration. So our sympathetic um, uh, nervous system is activated. But if we can't run, or if we can't fight our way out of whatever the threat is, the next best option for us 
is the freeze response. So in freeze, we go into dissociation, we get numb. So our, you know, I'll talk a little bit more about this. Well, maybe I'll just talk about it now. But so uh, you know, our body gets flooded with our our natural um, opioids to numb the not only our physical body but our emotions as well, because our mind doesn't differentiate between physical and emotional pain. Um, we can go into depression and helplessness, shame and shutdown. So, you know, these are these are sort of um, and we'll talk a little bit more about them, but like two sides of the same coin when it comes to trauma responses. So it's like the fight or flight or the freeze response if we're not able to get out of or fight or, or run from whatever the threat is. So these are normal trauma responses and there's a lot of wisdom in them. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit more, too. But so sort of stepping back and talking about our autonomic nervous system. So they call it auto because it, you know, of course, it regulates all sorts of things, our heart rate, our blood pressure, our body temperature. And thank goodness it's automatic because um, we most of us probably wouldn't survive long if we had to remind ourselves to breathe and our heart to beat and all of that. Um, but because it was automatic for a long time, uh, people thought that you couldn't tap into the autonomic nervous system, but we know now that you can. And the breath is, like I had mentioned earlier, one of the most powerful ways to sort of tap into the autonomic nervous system. And there are two parts of it, the sympathetic nervous system. I think of that like the gas on a car. When a threat's detected, we need to run, we need to fight, we need to activate our, you know, our body. Um, this is the sympathetic nervous system that, that goes online. The parasympathetic nervous system is like the brake on a car. When the threat is gone, we, the brake is engaged so that we're able to come back to a state of rest and digest. And so again, these are not the only responses that we can have to trauma. There are others, but these are the main ones that we know about. Fight and flight, freeze and faint. And so one of the things that's been really Really helpful for me personally, but then also sharing with people. I do a lot of um, meditation and work with people in recovery. Is helping us understand what happens in the body when we have a when we um, have a stress response. So if we go into fight or flight, one of the things that happens is our body gets a shot of adrenaline, which increases our heart rate, increases our respirations, and both of these things help us to be able to get oxygenated blood to the body, so we can run faster, fight harder to be able to survive whatever the threat. Is um, cortisol is released in our system, which shuts down our digestion. Digestion takes an awful lot of energy for our body to, to, to do. And so if we are running or fighting for our lives in this moment, digesting breakfast, lunch, dinner, snacks, whatever, not a priority. So the energy that was going to be used to digest the food goes to the rest of the body to be able to um, survive the threat. Um, another thing you might notice with that digestion when it shuts down, if you, you know, if you sort of pay attention when we tend to go into fight or flight, you might notice your mouth gets really dry. Again, that's because our digestion shutting down. It's like, hey, you don't need to digest food right now. So, you know, the salivary um, production slows significantly. We also get a shot of glucose in our system. Of course, we know glucose is energy, our, you know, a form of energy that our body uses. It's quick energy. So we get a glucose dump so we can run faster, fight harder. Blood gets diverted from the hands and the feet. So you might notice cold and clammy hands and feet. Um, that's because blood gets diverted from there to the large muscle groups, again, to serve try to better survive the threat. And our senses get really heightened. So our, our sight gets better, our hearing, you know, you pick up every little sound, your sense of, you know, like anything that touches your body gets heightened. So all of our senses sort of go on hyper on, on high alert. And this is all really important if we are under a physical threat and we do need to run or to fight. But our, even just simply thinking of um, something can activate the stress response in us. And so um, when we are sort of in that constant stress response, you know, over time, if our heart is having to work extra hard because it's beating really fast and pumping blood to all parts of the body can lead to things like stroke, heart attack, heart disease, um, that constant glucose dump can lead to things like diabetes, uh, the Digestion constantly shutting down can lead to all sorts of digestive issues. Inflammation in the body becomes an issue. And over time, if it's too dysregulated, the, the body starts to turn on itself. And that's where you start to end up with autoimmune um, diseases and disorders. 
I mentioned and you saw we saw on the graph with the freeze response that um, w- one of the things that Dr. Perry talked about is that um, so when we're in fight or flight, that's a sympathetic nervous system. But when we go into that freeze faint response, that's actually a combination of the sympathetic nervous system. But again, because we can't run or fight from it, then the parasympathetic is activated. The wisdom of our body knows we can't run at 180 miles an hour forever. And so if the if the threat continues to be present, but we can't run or fight from it, this is, like I mentioned earlier, our next next best option. So one of the things is, is that our senses tend to, the input in how sensory information is processed tends to sort of get jumbled up. We're not as attuned. Our senses aren't as heightened. Um, there's also physical and emotional numbing. I had mentioned that, but our natural endogenous chemicals start coursing through us. Um, because our blood pressure and our heart rate decreases, and if it decreases too fast, that can lead to to dizziness, lightheadedness, I can even lead, lead to the faint response. Um, so, so all of these things help our, you know, in a way, help our body to be able to not be at that 180 miles an hour. Um, so it's a good thing. And yet, um, one of the things it was sort of described to me when you're trying to drive a vehicle with both the gas and the brake at the same time, it's it's not a good situation. So even though this is sort of our best option, if we're in that unrelenting stress and trauma, over time, it also has an impact. And one of the ways that it can impact us is through dissociative disorders, where we just really are completely disconnected from the body, disconnected from our emotions. And when you think about it, you know, life is really about experiencing things. It's about being in connection with other people. But if our trauma and our stress has led us to a place where we check out from those things, then it makes it really hard to have strong, healthy relationships. Um, People are much more prone to injuries when um, they're in this state because if they're not paying attention in their body and what their body is doing, they're more likely to get hurt. So um, there's, there's issues, of course, with this too over time. When we think about the nervous system, it's comprised of different parts. You have the brain, you have the spinal cord, all the nerve and nerve endings that go throughout the body. And again, the primary purpose of the nervous system is to keep us alive. And our our experiences are what help us wire the brain. So when we come into this world, we do have a few connections that are made, um, but we haven't had a lot of experiences yet. So you can see from like birth to age seven, there's an explosion of neural connections where they call it branching. Think of like trees, the neurons are trying to connect. And really the purpose of what the brain is trying to do in the first few years of life, you know, first three to five years of life is make sense of all of this sensory input that's coming in. We sort of take it for granted as adults, but you know, I can look around the room and identify, oh, that's a square or look at how the light is or colors or sounds or all of that. But these are all things that the human brain has to learn what it is, is it safe or not, um, what the impacts are. So everything from interactions that we have, um, the brain is trying to make sense of all of this information coming in. And when I learned about this, it really gave me insight. I'm a mother of four and it really gave me insight. Like, why do babies sleep so much? It's not just so their bodies can grow. It's so their brains have the opportunity to to, um process and integrate all of this sensory information that they're literally being bombarded with. So um, so you can see lots of neural connections at age seven. Um, some of those connections are really robust. So there are those thick lines that are in there. Um, those are the experiences that happen over and over and over again. So things like sight reading, you know, when you first... <laughs> I know my 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 older two kids, um, my girls, they really had a hard time learning how to read. You know, and sight words are supposed to be automatic, but anybody who's tried to teach a child to read knows that sight words initially are not automatic. Um, so, uh, but now um, for them, they very much are. I, I would invite you to just sort of humor me for a second so we can see what this looks and feels like. But if you have your arms crossed, just go ahead and uncross them. And then cross your arms. And as you cross your arms, just notice what arm is on top, your right or your left arm. And then we'll shake it out. And then cross it so your other arm is on top. I can't, I can't see most people. Um, but I would imagine, um, we've, I've, I've done this enough. I would imagine that, um, when I first asked you to cross your arms, you didn't have to think about it. 
feels normal, feels natural, feels good. Um, when I asked you to cross your arms the other way, you probably had to think about it. It probably felt really uncomfortable because your brain doesn't have a strong wiring for crossing your arms the opposite way. It really doesn't have a need to. Um, but this gives us insight and reminds us sort of as adults um, that learning new things and doing things differently can feel uncomfortable can be hard. We have to give a lot of attention to it initially. And so I think that's really important when, we, um, when we're talking later about resilience strategies and things that we can, practices we can do, that it takes time to wire in new patterns and habits. Another critical thing that's happening, a lot of times we focus on what happens in the brain in the first three to five years of life, which is super important. So it's good that we do that. But there's also this really important window of development that's happening around puberty. Um, and again, just sort of noting, depending on the population you're working with, if they're highly traumatized or not, the, that window is going to be different. So it might be earlier for kids who've experienced lots of trauma. It might be eight, nine, 10, and 11 versus kids who haven't experienced lots of trauma. That window might be 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 years old. But what the brain is doing is it's trying to get more efficient. There's so many neural connections. It takes a while to figure, you know, to like make its way through. So what it starts doing, the brain starts pruning away those connections that you don't use very often. Um, you probably have heard the term use it or lose it. And any of us who have ever tried to learn a second language know if you're immersed in it and you're practicing it regularly, um, you're going to be able to remember it more. But if you don't continue to practice it on a regular basis, you're probably going to lose a lot of that language acquisition unless it's a, your first language. So if it's a second or third language, that repetition is really important to keep those neural connections there. Um, this is another person I, I follow a lot of his work. His name is Dr. Dan Siegel. And um, one of the things that has been really helpful for me is thinking about what happens in the brain when a stress is or a threat is detected. So information comes in from the outside or inside our body, and um, it goes up the, um, the spinal cord, up the base of the brain. So it has to go through the brain stem and the lower parts of the brain first, which in the lower parts of the brain are the amygdala. So if the amygdala detects or identifies a threat, then the brain goes into what we call an, a, an amygdala hijack. And when the amygdala hijacks the brain, it shuts down the thinking part of the brain. Because if we are in a, a true threat and our life is in danger, to stop and really think through, what should I do now? We'll be dead. We need to, we need to just react. We need to just do it. And so the thinking part of the brain tends to shut down. The amygdala is what's, I, I say, what's driving the bus. Um, and so the way that Dr. Dan Siegel sort of um, shows this is through the handy model of the brain. So if you would, um, this is something that um, kids, is, kids especially find really helpful, but even as adults. So thinking about this being like the spinal cord, this is the brain stem, this part right here, um, if you fold your thumb in is like your amygdala, your limbic region, amygdala, hippocampus, holding your fingers over your thumb, this would be your cortex, and this part here is your prefrontal cortex, this is your logical, rational thinking part of the brain. So when the amygdala detects a threat, we flip our lid. Now, if we flip our lid and then um, we get some more sensory Im information and we determine, so here's a quick example. So let's say there's a, there's a loud um, boom and I look outside, I'm like, oh my gosh, what was that? So I'm a little bit hypervigilant. I'm, I'm no, like trying to figure out what's going on. And then I notice, oh, it's just a car that backfired out, you know, outside there. So right away then there's this calming, uh, they call it hugging your amygdala, your prefrontal cortex comes back online. Um, but if I look outside and I see like a car on fire and people are trying to run out of the car and they're on fire, my, I'm probably going to stay in this state. Um, so it's important to just recognize that, that that fight or flight response can last for anywhere from a couple minutes or a minute, even a couple seconds, if we identify quickly, oh, this actually isn't a threat. But if a threat is detected, that um, sort of we can stay in that threat response or that stress response for several hours afterwards, even after the threat has abated. And so stress hormones really affect the way that the brain wires. Um, in, in childhood, it affects the way that certain parts of the brain are able to mature 
and connect. And it's interesting. There's a neuroscientist. His name is Dr. Marty Teicher. And I was listening to him speak on an, at an international trauma conference. And he said in their lab, in his lab, he studies the, the, the brains of individuals who've experienced trauma. And when they look at the brains of people who've experienced trauma, even if they don't have a current mental health diagnosis or an issue or anything like that, um, their brains structurally look different than the brains of someone who have not experienced trauma. So the brain not only wires differently, but structurally it looks different. An important piece to know is that our brain doesn't know the difference between physical and emotional pain. I think it's really unfortunate in our society that we treat pain um, differently, whether it's a physical or an emotional pain. So if a kid is on the playground and they're on the monkey bars and they fall and break their arm, we would never say to them like, oh, just go back to the classroom, sit down, you're fine, right? We would get them, we would get them medical attention. Um, but if a child is bullied on the playground, on the bus, if they experienced you know, a, a big fight between their parents the night before, their brain might be activated as if they're experiencing physical pain. One of the researchers who studies pain said it said in their in their studies, they would um, bring in people who were experiencing emotional pain and they would give them ibuprofen and Tylenol and they felt better. So when we think about especially this opioid crisis and what's happening, there's a lot of people experiencing a lot of emotional pain. Opioids work really good for pain. So I think recognizing this is an important part. of helping to address what's driving a lot of the opioid crisis. And so what gives me a lot of hope is knowing that there are, there are practices and things that we can do that can help us to reset the nervous system and to create new pathways and patterns for thriving. And so in the resilience literature, there's sort of three core protective systems that they talk about that we look at. So that includes the individual capabilities, um, which is my own ability let me see. Yeah. Okay. I'll talk about that in a second. Attachment and belonging and then community culture and spirituality. And so in individual capabilities, one of the first um, pieces is having a positive view. So, you know, the whole thing, like, is the glass half full? Is it half empty? Those who have the sort of more positive, the, the glass is half full are going to, um, so individuals who have that sort of perspective are going to be able to, even in difficult situations, see the good, see the positive. Because even when things can be really, really hard and difficult, it doesn't mean that there's nothing to be grateful for. And having a positive view is really closely tied to hope. If I have a positive view, I have hope for the future, that things can get better, that things can change. But if I don't have that view it's and I don't have hope, I'm a lot less likely to ask for help if I need it, because why would I ask for help? If nothing's going to change and nothing's going to get better, there's no point in asking for help. So one of the most powerful ways we can build positive view is through gratitude practices. There's lots of different practices. So if you want to just sort of Google and look up um, gratitude practices, but one that me and my family have been using is just writing down at the end of the day before bread three good things that happened to you that day, three things that you're grateful for. Um, and that really what it does is it starts to train your brain to notice the good things. Um, we have sort of this natural um, negativity bias that these gratitude practices can help us to offset. Um, another thing is self-efficacy, which is the belief that what I do matters, the decisions I make impact my life. Now I recognize I don't get to control everything that happens to me, but with awareness, and that's such an important caveat, with awareness and mindfulness, I have the ability to choose how I want to respond to what's happening to me. A really like beautiful, amazing example of this is Nelson Mandela, right? Being in prison for all those years, and he didn't allow that to make him bitter, to make him hateful. Um, he continued to have love in his heart and to have a positive view. Um, and, and so self-efficacy, again, like we don't always get to control what happens to us, but with awareness, we can choose how we respond. And then self-regulation, which is really that noticing, like what part of the nervous system are we in? Which is why for me, like starting to understand what happens when I'm in the stress response, you know, is my mouth dry? Are my hands cold and clammy? My gut sort of feel, we, I, I might be in the stress response. Do I feel like emotionally numb? Do I feel, um, 
Am I having a hard time remembering things? That's a good indicator to me that I've been dissociating. So self-regulation is first that like checking in and noticing where are we at in our nervous system? And then what are those practices we can do to re-regulate? Attachment and belonging is another really important piece to this. Um, I think of all of these as sort of nested bowls. I used to live in a really small house with a tiny kitchen. And so nested bowls were really um really a wonderful thing. Um, but the individual capabilities would be the smallest um, bowl and then attachment and belonging is that next one and community culture and spirituality is that next one out. And so how healthy and well I am affects my relationships, how healthy and well those around me are, how healthy and well those around me are affect how healthy and well the community is. Because community is nothing more than the people that live in that place, right? Or that work at that place. Community can mean lots of different things. So attachment and belonging, part of that is when we're interacting with other people, especially young people, um, babies and children require adults to co-regulate. They don't, they're not born knowing how to regulate their own nervous systems. And so as adults, if we get really activated when kids have big emotional responses, they're having a tantrum, when they're really upset about something, we're not going to be that stable person for that child to co-regulate with. So, um, I often think of it as like the first step always is building our individual capabilities so that we can then be in a position to be able to co-regulate with someone who's really dysregulated. Might be a child, might be a partner, might be a coworker, might be a stranger on the street, right? But that that personal um, regulation is really key to that. And another piece of that is that this sense of belonging that we all have, we have this deep need for connection and belonging. And one of the, um, I, I wish I could remember where I heard this, but it made so much sense to me. They talked about how, you know, for most of human existence, if you lived by yourself or you were kicked out of the community, your chance of survival was slim to none. To be able to survive the elements and the animals and all of that stuff on your own, your chance of, of, your chance of survival went down significantly. So this sense of belonging is very much connected to our sense of safety and security. The more sense of belonging we have, the more safe and secure we feel, which is going to help us keep our thinking brain online. When we don't feel safe and we feel under threat, remember, we, are, we get an amygdala hijack, we flip our lid. And then thinking about things like community, culture, and spirituality. So where are those bigger places in the community where we feel like we connect, where we you know, can share food together and we can learn from one another and we have a strong sense of connection to one another and to something larger than ourselves, which really is what spirituality is about. That it's, it's more than just us and our own lived experiences, but this recognition that there's something much larger than us that we are all connected to. So I'm not sure how much, I, th I think I had till one o'clock and I'm at one o'clock on the dot, I think. So I, we can open it up for, um, for questions. I think I'm not sure how much time we have now, but, and I'm gonna, is it okay if I stop sharing the screen now or yeah. mm -hmm. I can see, see faces? Great. Yeah. And I think that if people have specific questions, you can either uh, chat them in or you can unmute and just interrupt and, uh, and she'd be happy to take questions. Yeah. Um, I have I have a bunch, so I, I can sure start. You know, I, and I've seen this talk before, but every time it seems to kind of say something different to me. But one of the things that you talked about was that original study being mostly middle class white kind of people. Did they ever redo that using a more, you know, a different kind of population? Oh, so there's, there's been a lot of ACES studies since then, um, different communities like Minnesota has done ACE, their own ACES study through the BRFIS, the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System. Um, so yeah, there have been states and, and communities that have sort of done their own ACES studies. It's interesting because sometimes um, what they'll do is they will, again, um, initially when I, when I started doing these presentations, there was sort of this like, well, these are, these are really the only 10 ACEs. Right. Like if, if it doesn't fit in here, then it's maybe not an ACE because it hadn't been studied in that way. But as we started to learn more and more about how the mind, the brain and the body respond to trauma, we started to realize that it was any situation that would bring about that stress response without there being some sort of a buffer, whether it be a person outside or our own individual resources that could help buffer that experience. 
um, that can end up being a trauma for us. So it might even be something really small, which as a mom sometimes is like, oh my goodness, like, you know, if my kid comes to me and they, they have an emotional request and I'm like busy making supper, you know, and I'm like, I, I you know, I'll get back to you in a minute. Like I got to get this done. If I don't, if I'm not able to meet that emotional request, that's a, it. I know it sounds harsh, but that's emotional neglect. Like I haven't, I haven't been able to support my child in their emotional development in that moment. Now, as it's impossible for us to do that hundred percent all of the time, which I think helps us also to understand and to have some compassion for ourselves and for others that we don't always get it right. We do the best we can with what we have, but um, it really is about like, what are those buffering pieces? So some communities and states actually changed up some of the ACEs. So in Philadelphia, they added, because a lot of the original ACEs are like, what happens in the household? But people were like, hey, what about like bullying at school? Or what about community violence? Or what, you know, what about these other things that also can lead to this dysregulated nervous system. So some communities have added their own ACEs to it. So, and what, and the studies, all of them continue to show that ACEs are very common. There's a dose response relationship. There's this like ongoing dysregulation of the nervous system. And um, I know you didn't ask this question, but this popped into my head and I don't remember if I've shared it before, but um, in that same international trauma conference, one of the things that they said is that they did a study where they looked at mothers who had experienced high ACEs and during their pregnancy, they were not experiencing any trauma or super high stress. And they um, sort of followed those mothers and those babies. And what they found is that even if those babies, those children didn't have ACEs, didn't have lots of trauma, the fact that their mom did when they were in utero, her nervous system you know, was more hypervigilant, more, um, more stress hormones going through her body, which then wired the baby's brain um, thinking like, hey, I'm going to be born into a dangerous world. So even just having the mom having had unresolved ACEs can lead to impacts in the next generations. So hmm. that's interesting. Are there, again, please butt in if you have a question, because otherwise I'll keep asking some. You know, I, I, do you think there's other human examples? This epigenetic thing really has always amazed me. Mm -hmm. And actually, I, I can remember reading about how horses can tell that there's a bear in the area and they've never seen or smelled a bear before, right? Mm -hmm. They can, but they smell it and they just wig out. Yeah. But if, if I think about certain groups, like maybe families of people during the Holy, Holocaust, you know, descendants, you know, there's, it seems like there's groups they could be studying epigenetic stuff on. Is, to your knowledge, is there anything like that? Yeah, absolutely. So there's a researcher, her name is Rachel Yehuda, and she has been studying a lot of the impacts of epigenetics in the Jewish community from the Holocaust. Um, oh. There's also been some studies done on, you know, indigenous, Dr. Maria Yellowhorse Braveheart has done some work with uh, around indigenous communities. And I think there's been some research that's been looking at um, epigenetic impacts in um, African-American communities. So, uh, but the, but Rachel Yehuda, I think it's Y-E-H-U-D-A. She's really the one that has been studying epigenetics genetic and effect, those effects on populations who've experienced wow. sort of a collective trauma. Hmm. Yeah, that, that's just fascinating. So I suppose around your house, you say, are you flipping your lid? Do you say that a lot? Yeah, it's funny because around the time that I was learning a lot of this, one of my daughters learned at school, she's like, when you flip your lid, you become a turkey. So that was sort of the language we, we jokingly said was, you know, if you flip your lid, then you, you become a, you know, you look like a turkey. Um, but yeah, we, we do talk, we use that language. And I think it's really helpful to start young. Um, you know, another thing that we can start young is um, naming emotions, helping give language for ki to kids around emotions that they're feeling. And I think this is really important too, but something we don't often think about is, you, you know, our, the words we use is really important. So like to say, um, I, I I see you're mad is different than I see you feeling mad or you look like you feel mad, right? When we say I am mad or I am this, we're like really taking that on, but we're actually not that thing. We're experiencing that emotion. So being able to articulate and say, I see that you're feeling, it looks like you're feeling upset. You know, what I notice is your slumped shoulders. So then you would, you would sort of mirror back to them. What do you see? I see your shoulders slumped. I see your head down. You know, are, are you feeling sad? You know, so being able to give some of that language is really helpful. Um, and I, I lost the second part that I was going to say. So never you know, mind. someone brought up the book, The Rabbit Effect. Have you read that? 
rabbit effect. The, ra- the rabbit effect. Yeah. I, ha- I have not. No. No. By Kelly Harding, it brings in the concept of epigenetics. I'm going to have to look that up. Jane, do you want to comment on that? It was, uh, I, I invited her, I'm in the, I'm a lead the Health and Aging Policy Fellows Book Club, and we invited Kelly, um, really enjoyed it, easy to read. Um, I don't know if you can see the title backwards on there. But I was, I, I really enjoyed it. it, brings in a lot of the things that you were talking about with the epigenetics, and you know, you read it and you kind of, you know, then you think you've just, you know, completely ruined your children for life and um, and she does kind of calm me down a little bit, you know, uh, uh, <laughs> through yeah. that. But yeah. it's it's kind of a, like I said, it's a it's a it's a uh, I th- it was a nice, well written book and and kind of touches on a lot of this too. So great, thank you so much for that research. I I I don't know if you can tell. I love learning about this stuff, and you know, and and it is it's such a personal thing being a mother of four, and like really trying to learn these things in a way that I can implement it with my with my kids. But then also like, it's, it's one of those things where the more I practice it and get better at it within my own personal life, it allows me to bring those tools and practices in, in a really authentic way with the clients I work with. So it's not like a do as I say, but it's like, these things have helped me so much. And this is how it's helped. And this is what I've noticed. Like there's just a different resonance when you're sharing about your own experiences with these things versus like something really interesting you read or heard about. Right. So, yeah, but thank you for that, for that resource. I will definitely check it out. She's really nice too. So if you reach out to her, I'm sure she would (laughs) respond. Great. No, thank you for that, Jane. All right. Any other questions before we let Susan going. She did not uh, disappoint as usual. Um, by the way, Susan, we need to we need to get these podcasts done with you because they would they would just smash the charts because this is always so interesting. So we're going to reach out to you and get that, that done. Great. I'll, I'll watch for your email. Yeah, it's, okay. and as always, it's, it's good to see you. All right. Well, thank right. you everybody yeah. for coming. Thanks for the invite. All right, everybody, have a good week. And again, tomorrow uh, the echo for. Um, uh, macro dosing is on at 1215 with fellows from the University of Minnesota. So feel free to join us. And on Thursday, our echo, COVID echo is uh, Dr. Shacker from U of M and he is amazing. So uh, if you have time to make that, I would suggest you make that as well. It's great. He's, he's going to give an update on COVID. I'll talk about the new variants. It's going to be amazing. So, all right, everybody. Thanks so much. Have a good day. Thank you.